spot walking through the city. No, I'm a small part of this. Yo, welcome to Alpha Omega University again. Today is reset day. So we don't expect a lot of uh, a lot of viewers today, but the ones that you are here, I appreciate you all. Uh, keep that stream on. Maybe you'll learn something while you're massing, right? Because uh, I'm pretty sure right now it's like most people are like massing and shit. They're still getting ready, right? And so at least you guys got something to do while you guys are waiting for the caller to be like, let's go, let's go get some kills, right? So uh, the learning never ends. Like I was talking to uh, the, the guys in the chat there. Right. The, the, the learning never ends. We always got to keep progressing. We always got to get better. And today we're going to be having episode four and it's titled Zerg Bootcamp. Right. So uh, for anybody that doesn't know, maybe you're from a different country or whatever. Like I, I live in the U.S. Right. So I don't know if you guys like in, uh, in European countries or anything like that uh, call it any different. But basically bootcamp in the U.S. is like when when uh when you first enlist in like the military, right? And so they send you to like the basic training, like the initial like military training, right? Like that's what boot camp is. I, I don't know if somebody, you guys can let me know in the chat if there's any like anybody from a different country here, if that's what they call it over there too. But yeah, so Zerg boot camp is exactly what, you know, what I'm explaining, right? It's, it's basically how to train a Zerg, how to basically train a Zerg to be able to compete at the highest levels. But here's the thing, right? Everybody knows how to train a Zerg, right? Saying, I don't know how to train a Zerg. That, 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 that's not true. Everybody knows how to train a Zerg. You go out there and you fucking fight and then you die, right? That, that, that's how you train a Zerg. But being able to train a Zerg in a way in which it won't drain all the money out of the pockets of both the players, the individual players that are learning, and the guild, right? Because the guild's got to do re-gears and stuff like that, right? So it takes a lot of effort and not only does it take a lot of effort in the economy sense it also takes a lot of effort in the sense of like a uh, uh time commitment right so like if you think about it it's like oh well i'm gonna go i'm gonna go and like train up this zerg right and and you know what does that mean that means that you need a caller right and that caller needs to take their time and it's like okay well we're gonna go and fight and it's like yeah sure you're gonna fight and so you mess up at you know, whatever, 18 UTC, 21 UTC, 00, 00 UTC, right? You mass up and you get a fight and let's say you only fight one time. So then you got one fight worth of experience. Say the fight was 10 minutes long. That's a pretty, pretty good long fight, right? It's a good fight, 10 minute long fight. And you know, that's great. It's great experience, but how quickly are you going to get to the point where you're going to be able to progress and get better? Not very quickly, right? Because you're only fighting one time a fucking day, maybe two times. If you play a lot, you'll be playing, you'll be fighting three times a day, right? And that's the truth, right? Most people don't play more than like two timers. Uh, you know, if, if you play more than two timers, you're 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 on the lower end of the population, and when it comes to 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 Albion, right? So, basically, what I'm saying is, how do we speed up the process of training an entire Zerg while at the same time reducing costs right and that's the main main point that i'm going to be talking about today right um how to, how to train a zerg properly right because there are many ways to train a zerg not like improperly like like where the zerg ends up learning bad habits they end up doing like the wrong things right but to train a zerg properly and yet do it efficiently quickly and economically right so that's basically gonna gonna be the topic of the day um i don't think that this episode's gonna be too long um because it's it's pretty straightforward right it's not it's not like the previous episodes where i'm kind of making an argument on things i'm kind of just letting you know my experience with this episode right this episode is more for uh kind of like giving you guys the the information that i've learned over the years and 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 i've learned i've trained many many zergs right i've trained zergs that were like at the top levels of the game and i've trained zergs that were like at the bottom right and so i, I i've trained many different zergs also from different guilds right with different kind of guild cultures and different even even zergs with uh that, that speak a different language right so there are a few things that i learned that helped s expedite and make it more efficient to train a zerg right so i'm just basically just putting it forward to you guys my experience and then you guys can do with it what you guys prefer to do 
uh, you know, kind of maybe talk to your guild leaders and stuff, maybe influence them to follow some of these ideas or at least try them out, right? Like, don't just shut down ideas because like, oh, well, nobody does that or, or oh, that's too hard to do. You got to try things out, man. You got to try things out because these are the things that have worked for me, right? So the very first thing you got to do in order to train a Zerg, right? We got to kind of zoom out, right? When I say zoom out, you kind of got to look at what Zerg are you training, right? You have to identify your Zerg. So when I say identify your Zerg, you really have to look at everything about your Zerg. What, what Zerg are you going to train? Like everybody says, yeah, yeah, yeah. We just got to train the Zerg. We got to train the Zerg. Okay, but what the fuck does that mean? You need to identify what Zerg you are training. So what I mean by that is, first of all, you got to identify the scale, right? So are, are, are you training a, a, a 30 v 30 type Zerg, right? Like that's kind of like a, a smaller scale, right? Like, or, or, or like 20 man Zerg, 30 man Zerg, right? That's kind of a little more small scale. And are you training that kind of Zerg, right? Is that what your guild mass is? Is that what your alliance mass is? Is 20, 30, uh, you know, people? It's like, okay, if that's what they mass, then guess what? Then, then that's kind of like small scale, right? So then you have to acknowledge that and be like, okay, there are certain things that work really well for a, like larger scale, but they're not as efficient or as good ap or as applicable for like smaller scale, like 30 v 30, right? So acknowledging the size of your Zerg, right? The scale that you're going to be fighting is very important, right? So if you're going to be fighting like 40 v 40, 50 v 50, everything up to like 70 v 70, maybe even 80 v 80, right? That's kind of like medium scale. Right. So like think about like everything below 30 man. And and honestly, if you go below 20 man, that's not even like ZBZ anymore. Like that's kind of like that's kind of like a, a, a like a like a scrimmage of some of some sort, right? Like a like a little a skirmish, a little skirmish, right? But but 20 between 20 and 30, yeah, Romy, that could be Romy. Yeah. So like between 20 and 30 guys on your side of the field, right? That's a small scale. Between 30 and 80 or so. 75 maybe right that's like medium scale and large scale is everything above that right so like 80 90 100 120 whatever right like that that's that's large scale right so you got to acknowledge where you fit in with these and by the way i didn't just make these numbers and be like yeah like uh 30 sounds like a good number uh, 80 sounds like a good number you know no 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 I, I i made these numbers on purpose right because there are things that work at about 50 60 man group that doesn't really work as well with like a 90, 100 man group, right? Conversely, there are things that work at a 100 man group that totally does not work at like 25 man group or the opposite, right? So acknowledging the size of your Zerg is extremely important, extremely important, right? Um, another thing you have to acknowledge is what kind of enemies are you usually fighting? Right, that's very important. Like people tend to look at their Zerg and never look at the enemy. They'll just be like, yeah, my Zerg is just gonna like be able to do everything. And it's like, no man, you can't do that. Like you have to specialize, right? Specializing is a good thing, right? If you specialize your Zerg to be able to compete against a, very, a specific style of Zerg, then guess what? Every time you find that Zerg on the field, you're gonna beat them, right? And if you specialize your Zerg to, to you know, be weak against a specific style, then guess what? You know coming into the fight, damn, I'm at a disadvantage. And just knowing that is very important, right? So acknowledging your Zerg, acknowledging the size of your Zerg, as well as the size of the enemy Zerg, is extremely, extremely important. Yeah, like Gath is saying on, on the chat, it's like, do do research before fighting. That's that. It's so important, man. Like, I, I want to say, like, I, I, I can't put an exact percentage, but let's say like 40, 50% of the entire chance that you have at victory in a zvz has to do before you even leave the hideout or leave the city right like all of that shit is so important and if you don't have that stuff settled before you even leave the hideout then you're kind of putting yourself at a disadvantage for no reason right another thing that you have to identify with your zerg is you have to identify the role distribution of your zerg right so once you look at the zerg let's say you got a 50-man group right you're like okay a 50-man group i have a medium size medium scale zerg right cool so now you got to look at role distribution. It's like, great, you have 50 men, but out of out of those 50 men, how many tanks do you have? And, and I don't mean like, oh, you're going to force people to be tanks. No, 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 no. I, like you can, you can fill roles. Everybody can fill roles, right? But what I'm talking about is how many tanks do you actually have that are reliable 
tanks that you're like, yeah, these guys are actually good. Like these guys, these, these guys will make it work, right? How many actual tanks are reliable? Conversely, how many healers do you have that are reliable? How many supports do you have that are reliable? How many DPS? And here's the thing. This is one of the biggest things that especially smaller guilds or like up and coming guilds who are like training really hard to get better, right? Those guilds, this is exactly when they get stumped, man, because they're doing all the right things, but then they forget to look at the role distribution of their Zerg because they don't realize that they're trying to play a play style that basically says like, oh, I'm going to play very defensive, right? And I'm going to rely on my tanks. But it's like, dude, you don't have that many good tanks in your Zerg. You actually have a lot of great DPS. And it's like, if you have a lot of great DPS in your Zerg, exploit that, right? Let your, your good DPS take control of the fight, right? Allow them to, to get in there and do what they need to do. Same thing, if you have a lot of healers, then you know you can play a little bit more aggressive because you know that the healers will be able to, to uh, out heal the enemy when it comes to like fights that are like back and forth right like i engage then they engage then i engage then they engage right and it's like my healers are better than the enemy healers so i'm gonna be able to sustain better right those things are very important understanding the role distribution of your zerg is extremely important just because you force three out of every four tanks in your zerg to switch into tank right like let's say three out of every four tanks that you have in your zerg are actually like i don't know dps players right and, and you tell them, no, 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 you're not DPS, you're fucking tanking today because that's what we need. And it's like, listen, you got to do what you got to do, right? But when three-fourths of all your fucking tanks are literally fucking not tanks, right? Like, they're not tanks by trade, they're tanks by just because that's what they're wearing, but they're not actually used to playing tank. Then you got to realize, man, like, you're going to be at a disadvantage when it comes to tanks, right? So acknowledging the role distribution of your Zerg, extremely important. The next thing is, you also have to acknowledge in that same vein of like role distribution, right? You have to acknowledge which people in your Zerg are quote unquote elite players, right? This is extremely important because every single guild, I don't care how small the guild is, man. The guild can have 10 fucking people that show up to ZVZ. It doesn't matter. At least one of those fucking guys is going to be quote unquote elite player. And what I mean by elite player is not that I'm saying that they're one of the best in the entire game. No, what I'm saying is they're one of the best in that guild, right? So every single guild has their few like three, four dudes that are like carrying the Zerg every day. You know what I mean? Whether that's a DPS who literally gets like 80% of the kills every fucking fight or whether it's a, a tank that like just stops every engage that the enemy tries to do. Or, or, or it's uh, sometimes maybe it's the caller, right? Like the, the caller carries the Zerg because he, his calls are just so great, right? Whatever it is, you need to acknowledge who your elite players in your Zerg are and then allow them to do what they're doing, right? Allow them, basically talk to them, have a one-on-one -on -one with those guys. Be like, hey, listen, you're a great player, right? How, how can we take more advantage of you being a great player? And that's really it. Like, because a lot of times players are like, oh, you know, listen, uh, I'm, I'm, if you guys can like engage less often, that will help me get in position better to do my job, right? For whatever reason, you may be like, oh, that's stupid. You know what I mean? But it doesn't matter because that guy is carrying your guild anyway, isn't he? So if you can make that guy his job easier, then guess what? The entire Zerg is going to benefit from that, right? So identifying your elite players is very, very, very important, right? They might say things like, oh, you know what? If I had like a pocket healer that can follow me around, like um, th this has been a case a lot with like Gala team players, right? Gala team players, a lot, like especially the elite Gala team players, sometimes they've had like a, a healer literally be a pocket healer for them as if that Gala team player was a, a, uh, a, a caller or something right so it's like you 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 gotta understand like these people are elite you need to take care of them on the field man because they're gonna carry the the guild and and identifying those players is extremely important because then you get to tell your members hey guys make sure that guy doesn't die right make sure that guy is always cleansed don't let him get stunned don't let him get rooted right help him out pay extra attention to him that's important a lot of people say oh no well that's elitist well i mean it is elitist but you know what if they're carrying the zerg you have you have to do it otherwise you're gonna lose non-stop that is okay to do right another thing is you gotta acknowledge your zerg's willingness to learn right how much is your zerg actually willing to learn like 
everybody kind of takes it for granted. People say, oh no, well, yeah, and they play the game, they want to get better. Obviously, they want to get better because they're playing the game, right? It's like, no, man, there are some people who genuinely don't care. And that, that's really, really, really important. Like, some people could give a half a shit about whether they, 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 they learn more or not. And a lot of times it's because of ego, right? They, they think like, oh, well, I'm already good or I'm good enough or, or whatever it is, right? And it's like, a lot of times people are just like, I, I don't really care. I just want to have fun, right? And that's okay. That That's totally fine. But what I'm saying is you need to acknowledge that, right? Because if you're trying to train a Zerg and the majority of the Zerg is just like, I don't care, then you're kind of wasting a lot of effort, right? And, and, and you're not tackling the real issue. The real issue needs to be tackled first is you need to tell them and convince them as to why getting better is better, right? Why they need to learn, right? It's just like this stream. Like a lot of people, right, know about this stream happening and there are people that could use like this stream to like get better at the game, right? But so many people are just like, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it. And it's like, well, well, well why not? It's like, oh, well, let's say they have the time. Let's say they have whatever. But some people just genuinely don't care and maybe they don't care because they don't have a goal. Right. And, and that's another thing. It's like you kind of got to give your your guild a go. It's like, hey, because if you tell a bunch of people, hey, listen, we're going to learn to get better and then we're going to win ZVZs. Yeah, that's great. Right. It's like, yeah, I mean, that's great. That's great. That's 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 honorable. But the truth is, it's like you got to set goals for people. It's like, listen, we got to learn to ZVZ better so that we can take over this zone. Right. We want to take over this zone specifically. Right. This is a good zone. It has a fucking dungeon on it. It's T7, T8, whatever it is. Right. It's like, we want that zone or we want to have the hideout on this zone and the hideout is great and blah, 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 right? And then and then suddenly they realize, oh, wow, okay, so if I want to have that thing, then I have to get better. And now suddenly they want to, they want to get better. Uh, Crimson's asking, is this your point of view, the videos? Yeah, uh, most of them, yeah, yeah, this is, this is, this is my point of view. Um, I think like 99% of all the videos in this, in, in, in today's stream are going to be from my point of view. Um, so another thing about it is is so again remember when i was talking about ego right e ego might stop people from learning and you have to be wary of a veteran ego right uh like some veterans are just like li like how do i say this like some veterans are like i've already done it i'm already great i'm already amazing right so i don't have to get better or some people in that same vein might be like i'm the best in this guild so i don't need to get better right and and that ego is 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 very very uh disruptive to to being able to get better in the game right so you have to be be very careful of like veteran players or top elite players right and make sure that they're not ruining the new players ideas because the, those veterans will go and talk to new players and say oh don't worry about that oh that's stupid or, or don't listen to this guy don't listen to that guy right and so it's like that's extremely extremely important Right. So, so you guys have to like realize that if the next generation of players in your guild is already being kind of quote unquote tainted, right. By, by the ego mentality of others, that is, is kind of like a cancer that you cannot allow to take hold within the guild. Right. Um, and, and the last thing about identifying your Zerg is recruitment. Recruitment is very important for all guilds, right? Basically, you take everything that I just gave you, all the information that I just gave you, and now you understand what gaps do I have in my Zerg? Where, what do I need to recruit? It's not just I need to recruit people, anybody, anybody's fine. Not necessarily. Sometimes you may just have a lot of tanks and you're just like, you know what? I'm low on healers. I need to pick up healers. And so then you have to be like, okay, listen, if any healer wants to join this guild, then I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to give you like a uh, five mil or something like that. You know, just a little incentive or something to make sure that you're able to recruit the, the, the gaps that, that you're, 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 you're having in your guild. Yo, y'all criticizing me? Uh, let me see. Uh... No, the number one mistake is where he's standing. Typically, a heavy mace would be playing on choke and walking in when the enemy is engaged. Uh, what fight is this? Uh, I. Oh, oh, I'm calling. Uh, the caller right here in this fight, the caller like right here in this fight, uh, died, and so I started calling. So yeah, I don't like calling with heavy mace because it's it's. It's really hard. It's it's like it gets you out of position and shit. It's it's not great. So yeah. So this fight specifically, I'm calling right now. 
Yeah. Yeah, I usually call with a uh, soul side. Like a lot of people, a lot of people like calling with different weapons, like uh, like the one-handed mace and stuff. Listen, I've tried it. I think, I, I think it's okay. But personally, I just need, I just need the soul side to have that mobility, right? Um, but every caller is different. So yeah, right there, I just picked up because the main caller died. Um, all right. So the next one is identify your caller, right? So after you've identified the entire Zerg as a whole, right? You now have to identify the caller, right? So identifying the caller is extremely important because it's it's not just like, oh yeah, this guy's gonna call. Like, <laughs> okay, great. Like that, that's not what I'm talking about, right? Identifying the caller is is you have to realize what kind of caller is that caller. And you have to also realize that not all callers call the same. And, and you know, it's funny that we're actually talking about like the, the, the calling and all that, because this is literally the next section, right? It's identifying your caller. Uh, because just like I told you guys right now, it's like I don't feel comfortable calling with anything other than a soul scythe, right? I, I just don't. Um, but other people do. And and the other people do feel comfortable calling from other things than a soul scythe. Why? Because they call differently than I do, right? I'm not saying, oh, I'm better than them or they're better than me. I mean, that's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Some people that call with one-handed mace are better callers than me. Some people that call with one-handed mace are worse callers than me, right? It doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with skill level. It has to do with the style, right? So like, I'll, I'll put it this way, like one-handed mace callers tend to call very aggressively. And the reason they call aggressively is because they're using a weapon that puts them right in the middle of the enemy. So they tend to engage deep into the enemy very, very often. Whereas callers that uh, call with Soul Scythe or Camlan, even Camlan too, because Camlan's ranged. So callers that tend to call with like a, a, a ranged weapon, uh, tend to be a lot more defensive because you're shooting it at a distance and you're usually engaging only the front line and then backing up, right? So it's just a matter of what you prioritize as a caller, right? Um, me personally, from the very beginning, I've, I've always been a very defensive type caller. Very, very, very defensive type caller, right? So, um, I, I mean, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but that's just my style. And that's what I'm trying to explain to you guys is that every caller has a style, even if they don't know their own style. Right, I know my own style because I've called for a long time, but most callers do not know their style. Why? Because most of them are new. And, and when I say new, I mean any caller that's called less than a year is a new caller, right? Like the, the truth is, is that the majority of callers in the game are new callers who don't have too much experience, maybe a few months of experience, maybe a season or so of experience. That's not a ton of experience. So they don't really understand what kind of style they're playing. So it's everybody else's in the Zerg's job to find out what kind of caller do we have, right? With the new callers, one of the biggest things I have to tell you guys is like, you need to be patient, man. Like they're trying to learn. And, and when you think like, oh my God, like there's so many Zergs, there's so many Zergs where there's so many players, individual players that go and shit on the caller and say like, oh, you got us killed, man. Oh, you, you know, you suck. And, uh, you know, you're, it's your fault and all this stuff. And it's like, listen, listen. The truth is, is that most callers know when they messed up. Like that's the majority of callers. The majority of callers know when they made a bad mistake, even new callers, you understand? But a lot of times because they don't want to sound like idiots or they don't want to be ridiculed or anything, they'll blame it on somebody else, especially the new callers. They'll tend to do that. They'll blame it somebody else. But trust me, they actually know that it's their mistake. Now, now, obviously, this doesn't answer all of them, right? There are some guys who literally have so much ego that they just think that they're perfect and, and nobody can ever tell them anything, right? There's a lot of callers like that. So, you know, just be wary. But in general, when there's a new caller, be patient with him. Be patient with him. You know, encourage him. Help him out. Tell him, hey, you know what? Right there, what you did there at that choke, uh, we probably shouldn't have engaged there because they had cooldowns, right? And it's like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll take a look. And if you guys have videos, like show him on the video, right? Take the time because at the end of the day, whether you like this caller or not, he is your caller, right? He is your caller. At the end of the day, he's going to call again tomorrow. He's going to call again the next day. And he's going to call again next week and next month and next season right? Most likely, unless something happens, but you can't plan on that. For the time that he is in your guild, he is your caller. And it's better if you teach him so that he can get better. And that way you as a Zerg entirely can get better, right? So identifying your caller is extremely important. Um, there's another thing too, is experienced callers. Now, there are some callers who are very experienced, right? And they come from other guilds or whatever, and they join your guild, okay? 
I want you guys to be very careful with these kinds of collars. And, and the reason is, is because these kinds of collars sometimes have a very strong ego. And the reason they have a strong ego is because they used to call for a different Zerg. And in that different Zerg, maybe that Zerg was better than your Zerg. So that Zerg won a lot of fights. So because that Zerg won a lot of fights, that caller thinks that, that, the, that he was winning because of him. And it may have been the Zerg instead of him, right? So when he goes and moves on to a different guild, suddenly he's leading different people who are used to engaging in a different way and, 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 and ZVZing in a different way, right? And move in a different way. And also the, these people don't may not even know this caller right? Maybe they just know him by name and that's it. Or maybe they don't know him at all. But this guy comes in acting like he, he owns the place, right? And it's like, you need to have those experienced callers, the, their ego needs to, needs to stay in check. Because remember, just because they're experienced does not mean that they can't continue learning. And it doesn't mean that just because they're really good ZVZers or really, really good callers in some other guild does not mean they're going to be good callers in your guild. Because again, remember, identify your guild. Your guild is different than every other guild out there, right? Uh, Lechero says that's that's happened on Consequence when Dreaded Legend joined. Did it? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'll take your word for it. But I mean, that. yeah, I mean, Dreaded Legend is a known name, right? And so a lot of times it's like callers go from one guild to another. And maybe the Zergs are good, but... They're just used to playing differently, man. And I, I tell you, I've experienced this many times, right? So it's like, I'll come into a Zerg and it's like, people, because they don't really know me, they 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 play differently, right? And it's like, I have to adjust the way I call for that new Zerg that I'm calling for, right? And it, it's very important. Most new callers don't know this, right? And this is also why it's better to kind of grow your own caller at home rather than pick up an experienced caller from somewhere else. So... I already talked about the aggressive versus defensive type of callers, right? With like Cam Land, Soul Scythe, One Handed Mace callers or Hodge callers, right? Those kinds of, there's also a, like Battle Mount callers, right? Um, so the calling style will benefit certain types of Zerg compositions. That's just the way it is. And so this is why you got to acknowledge your, your caller. Um, uh, one of the last two things here, right? So, so first of all, you have to trust your caller. When I say trust your caller, what I'm saying is, it's not necessarily like go and give him access to all the guild's funds, right? When I say trust your caller, I'm saying let them kind of guide the guild forward. It's very important because a lot of times you'll have a guild, uh, say uh, AO University Guild, all right? Uh, AO University Guild has a, a certain way that, that we do things and then suddenly we get this new caller, right? And this new caller is like, he, he seems to be good or whatever, or maybe he's not. I don't know, but we get a new caller. Great. And we have our own like composition sheets, right? Where we're like, yeah, we're, we have like 90% uh, of our DPS is melee and 10% is, is, is ranged, right? And it's like, it's great, right? And we have like these things and it's like, oh, Locust should always wear demon armor and whatever, whatever your composition is, right? Everybody has something different, but whatever your composition is. And then the caller comes in and it's like, hey, you know what? Like it's probably better if we change more to a ranged composition, right? And it's like, oh, no, no, no. We're going to keep to what we're doing. Just call. And it's like, listen, if the caller is telling you that they prefer to call for a different style of Zerg, give them the chance. Allow that caller to have a say in the compositions of the Zergs that he has to lead. Why? Because he probably will feel more comfortable leading a ranged Zerg than, than, a, than a melee Zerg. Or vice versa, right? Like, let's say your Zerg is completely ranged and, and he's used to fighting with Millies. Allow him to try to tweak a little bit of the composition. Maybe maybe not fully change over to what he's saying, but little by little, how about you start trying what he's doing because you're enabling him to do the best he can at the guild. And that ultimately is going to be good for the entire guild, right? So because of this, you have to be fluid, right? You have to be fluid. If, if there are multiple callers... Right. There are some callers that that that, you know, there are some guilds. Sorry, there are some guilds that have multiple callers, like two, three callers. Uh, and, and, and it's like one of them is like a little bit better than the rest, but not necessarily like clear cut. Right. Like there's a lot that are like some of them are pretty good. And that's about it. Right. You have two, three people who are really wanting to be callers. Be fluid, man. Allow them all a fair chance. Let them all call a little bit just because one of them had a lot of success one day or two days, or even one week, does not mean that he's better than the rest. It just means that he had success that week, right? 
Now, how do you know that the other caller is not going to have success for three, four weeks? You won't know. So you have to kind of shepherd that 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 growth of callers within your guild. So uh, in my experience, like uh, back in Blue Army, we had we had a uh, shit. At some point, we had like seven callers. And when I say seven callers, I'm not talking about like, you know, like uh, kind of whatever ish callers. No, I'm talking about callers that were able to like do really really well in in a hundred v a hundred plus situations right and and i mean like top of the line callers like and we had like six or seven of them right and, and here's the thing it's like how did we get there the way we got there is by allowing multiple people to have a chance at calling and little by little we built everybody up right people like uh del negro he was there right uh sarge right and i'm only mentioning them because they they you know they're they're prominent right now right sarge right um i i was there boldy was there right mojo was there sucks was there knight was there and there's so many people who literally picked up calling and and and, and grew as a caller in that guild because it was allowed the guild was allowing everybody to have a fair chance to continue growing if they wanted to and that's very very important because you can grow your own colors you can but you have to be patient with them all right so the next part is uh you got to identify your zerg's economy right so this is when i was telling you guys earlier at, at the start when i was talking about how how we, you got to make sure that you can train your zerg economically right and the reason you want to train your Zerg economically is because training a Zerg is expensive. Like it's it's very very expensive. If if you if you're an individual player and you're not like a guild leader or anything like that, you're just a a, a random member in whatever guild, right? And and you go to a ZVZ, I mean, you know the cost of every set that you lose, right? Now, what if I told you? What if I told you that from very beginning, from when you start playing the game up until when you actually become quote unquote experienced as a as a zvz player right and you're actually like and i'm not talking about your 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 elite i'm talking about i'm talking about till you get to the point of being just an average zvz player okay from going from like the bottom to an average zvz player right that entire trek is gonna cost you probably about seven eight hundred deaths okay now I, wa I want you to think about that. Seven, eight hundred deaths. Let, let's say let, 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 let's say seven hundred deaths, right? Let's say on a daily basis you die, or, or let's say six hundred deaths. Let's just go down a little bit to make it the math easier. So let's say on a daily basis you die three times, uh, whether it's three different CTAs or one CTA you die three sets, whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter, right? Let's just say on average you die three times per day. How many days is that, right? So you, you're talking about two hundred days. Remember what I said earlier, right? It's almost like a year before you can become like a quote unquote experienced DVZ -er, right? And that year is going to cost you because that's on average of three sets per day. But let's say there's some days that you don't log in, right? There's 365 days in the year, right? So essentially what I'm saying is if you're dying three times a day on average and, and that you play, then generally speaking, you're going to take about six, maybe 700 deaths before you've had a whole year of worth of good ZVZ experience, right? How much money is that? I mean, everybody's sets is different, right? Everybody's sets is different. And so you have to calculate how much gear that you're losing. How many sets can you individually afford to lose before you basically say, damn, this is, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. Here's the thing. Think about every time that you go out in ZVZ and die. I want you guys to think about of yourself as a human being, right? Every time you die in a ZVZ, I want you to think about that death like you just gained some fame, some real life fame, right? And that real life fame is like you getting better at the game, right? So instead of instead of like looking at like, oh, well, my character has like uh, this much spec in fucking longbow, right? It's like, okay, great. But it's like, how much spec does you, your, hum, hu, your human person, how much do you have spec in ZVZ? Think about it that way. And think about every death of yours in on the field as a, as a kind of like, you know, as a mob that you killed that is helping you progress, right? I know it doesn't feel that way and it kind of sucks, doesn't it? But that's the only way to learn. 
That's the only way to learn. And it's expensive, especially when you're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna run eight one, I'm gonna run eight two. It's like, listen, you're 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 gonna burn yourself out, man. Because no matter what you do, you have to get to those six, seven hundred deaths. You have to, you have to, because if you don't, then guess what? Your Zerg is probably carrying you. And if the Zerg is carrying you, are you actually learning? No, of course not, right? So you're gonna have to get there. It's gonna happen. It's happened to every single player in the game that, that has ever become good at, the, at, at ZVZ, right? Six, 700 deaths, right? Just have it in your head, okay? And that's again, just to become average. And so again, when you're looking as a guild leader, you have to assess, how many sets can your Zerg re-gear, right? Because some Zergs do re-gear, some Zergs do like loot splits or whatever, whatever they do, right? But how much economy, how much money can the guild give out before they decide that we can't do this anymore? Before they decide we're no longer going to give re-gears because we're out of money? How long before your guild breaks because your economy was, was destroyed by you training to, to ZVZ? Right. And, and, and again, training a Zerg, a lot of people think, oh, I'm training a Zerg. It's a season thing. It's not a season thing. It's not a season thing. I tell you there. I, I've never seen a single player in the game who has ever gone from knowing nothing to being even average as a ZVZ -er after one season, even if they played literally every single day. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. And, it, and if you think you're one, then you know what? I got the news slash. You're probably not, man. You're probably not. It's just the truth, right? It's just the facts. Again, remember, check your ego, right? Everybody's got a little bit of ego. They think they're 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 better than they are, but the reality is there, man. That's that's just what it is, right? So another thing is is you gotta acknowledge your guild's economy, your individual guild's economy. It's very important. Not just how much are you losing, but also think about how much are you gaining, right? Uh, are, are are you doing like are you gaining any money from people donating? Are you are you gaining any money from crafting, uh, taxes or 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 uh, the uh, crafting the crafting focus, right? How much money is your guild generating, and how much money can your guild fork out every single week? It's extremely important, right? Um, and again, all these things are before you even come out of the of the hideout, right? Like we haven't even got into the point where we're like, yeah, we're gonna go out and 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 fight, right? We're talking about all the obstacles for us to learn ZVZ, right? So another thing is that you need to acknowledge how much time it's gonna take to train the Zerg, right? Like I told you, about a year maybe. Okay, but maybe you have about, you know, four months. Okay, so for those four months, hammer it. Hammer the shit out of it. Work hard in those four months so that way your Zerg can get better and better and better, right? It's extremely important to acknowledge these things about your Zerg's economy because if you don't, you're just gonna crash and burn and then suddenly you're gonna have no guild and all of your efforts uh, went to the garbage. Um, the next part is identifying the different training methods. So once you've identified your caller, you've identified the, the guild economy, you're like, okay, I know how much we can spend. And, and you've identified your Zerg. It's like, I know what kind of Zerg style we can train, right? Now it really comes down to it. How are we going to train? How are we actually going to train a Zerg? Like, what are we actually going to do? Okay. And there are many things that you can look at. And but primarily you want to look at two things, right? Two of the things that are extremely important to identifying how to train your Zerg. Number one is time. How long does it take to get the content that is going to help train your Zerg, right? So if, if you're talking about like, you know, factions or, or, or you know, uh, a, a CTA timer or a castle or a whatever it is, right? Or territory. So how long does it take for you to mass up one, right? That's mass up, right? And then two, get your compositions ready, you know, get everybody to log in and then get the compositions ready. And then three, to get to the place where you're going to fight. And then four, to actually get the fight. And then five, to come back, right? Because it's not over. You got to come back, right? And, and then six, to like sort out whatever it is that you're going to do, whether it's re-gears or whether it's a loot split or whatever it is that you're going to do, right? Generally speaking, that amount of time is about an hour and a half. I mean, most CTAs at timers are like an hour and a half. So if you're thinking about it, you're spending an hour and a half. And out of those hour and a half, you actually spent fighting maybe 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes if you had a really good fight, right? So it's like, that's a lot of time commitment. And now let's look at the second thing, right? The second thing is the silver cost, right? How much money is it going to take? Okay, well, if I go out to fight a ZVZ or open world, 
right? And I'm going to fight against an enemy that is much stronger than me. Well, I I'm, I should already know that about 75% of my of my players are going to die, right? So if I have an 100-man Zerg, 75, 75 of them are going to die. And that means I'm going to have to regear 75 of them. And if, if a regear costs the guild on average 1 mil, then you already know that today you're going to lose 75 mil, right? It's really that simple. And then what if you regear and come back? And what if you, you do it again and again and you, you end up losing three sets? And now suddenly you have 150, 200 deaths. That's 150, 200 mil that you literally just lost in one CTA. Can your guild afford that, right? Or if you have a 30-man Zerg, the, the, the same thing applies. But let's say you lose 20 out of those 30. That's still 20 mil. And 20 mil for a guild that only masses 30 people, that's quite a bit, right? It does hurt. So what I'm saying is these two things are extremely important, right? You got to look at how long it's going to take. How much time is it going to take to get training, right? Out of that hour and a half that you're training, only like 10 minutes are going to actually be dedicated to learning, right? And then the silver cost. How much silver are you losing in those fights, right? So with that being said, those, those two being our criteria, I'm going to now give you guys different training methods to train Zergs, okay? So... The different training methods. So first, I'm going to go with the high cost and high effectiveness. So what I'm talking about is it's going to cost a lot of time and silver or, or at least one of those. OK, and when I say high effectiveness, I'm talking about how effective it is at training Zergs. Right. So so basically, like how well your your Zerg is going to learn to fight out of out of this activity. OK. So the high cost and high effectiveness is the regular full masses that everybody does. Okay. That's, that means that you take all fights, whether you're outnumbered or not, you take all fights out in the open world. You full mass your Zerg, you go out there, you take every fight. You don't give a fuck. That's high cost, right? Because you take every fight, you're going to lose some of them or maybe a lot of them. And that's going to be a lot of cost, uh, a lot of silver cost because you're full massing. It's also going to take a lot of time, isn't it? So that's going to be a very high cost thing to do is full massing but it's also very highly effective and why is it highly effective because it's it's literally what you're training for you're doing what you're training for you're training to zvz and guess what you're zvzing you're zvzing against open world people who know how to zvz or perhaps are learning how to zvz themselves right so you're literally training with the exact thing that you're you're training to do right it, it, it's kind of like if 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 you're like a tennis player and, and you're training for like a, um, you know, like a tournament, like a tennis tournament, and then you actually get to train with the people that you're actually going to gonna go up against in the tournament, right? And so it's going to be highly effective, right? So that that's the point, right? That's the, the, the only way to have high eff effectiveness, but it does come at a high cost because it's high amount of time and high amount of silver cost. OK, the next one, this one is a medium cost. OK, so it's kind of like in the middle with time and silver. And it also has about a medium effectiveness. OK, so this one is taking fights only when you're close to even numbers. Right. So basically medium cost, medium effectiveness. You're only taking fights when you're about even numbers. You're not taking out numbered fights. Right. And obviously you're, 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 you're taking fights when you outnumber the enemy as well. But generally speaking, if the enemy has more people than you, you're not going to fight. Right. So what does this do? This is, this is less effective than the full way of engage of, of fighting and just saying, I'm going to fight everybody outnumbered or not. Right. So the cost is a little less in, in the silver cost, but the time cost is still about the same. The medium effectiveness, right. Is, is because it's not as effective as fighting outnumbered outnumbered fighting outnumbered teaches you the best ways to play because it forces you to play better right this way it's medium only because you're fighting about even even odds right which is not bad it's it's not bad at all and a lot of guilds implement this they see a zerg that's like maybe they have like 40 people and the, the enemy zerg has like 50 55 and they're like nope i'm not gonna fight that and it's like you can win that fight but it is going to be harder than if you fought a Zerg that's also 40 people, right? So that's the medium cost, medium effectiveness. Now, the next one is medium cost as well, mostly because of time, but also silver. And this one is low effectiveness, right? Like very, actually very low effectiveness, okay? And this one is faction fights. 
Now, a lot of people are going to be like, no, no, faction is great. It's amazing. Listen, listen. The truth is, factions are good to teach general concepts about ZVZ, okay? But they are not good to train a Zerg. And the reason they're not good to train a Zerg is because when you fight in factions, you're fighting a completely different scenario. You're not, yes, you're fighting against other people, but you're not fighting against other people who are all in comms. You're not fighting against other people who are all playing at the same level. You're also not fighting against other people who have the right composition, right? Because factions tend to be a bunch of people who come out and it's like, like, let's say Fort Sterling is masked up and they're fighting against Thetford somewhere. And I see it and I'm like, oh, that sounds fun. I'm going to go inside the town real quick and I'm going to gear up. And then I come out with like, a, I, I don't know, like a one shot crossbow, right? Or maybe I come out with a siege bow. Siege bow's good, right? Siege bow's good for ZVZ, no problem. But I come out with a siege bow and the thing is, it's like the rest of the Zerg is like running like uh, melee DPS. And it's like, why am I running a ranged DPS when everybody else is running melee DPS? Well, that's because I didn't mass up with them. Also, I'm not in comms with them. So when they're like three, two, one, engage, it's like, uh, I, I'm not there with them, right? And you can say, oh, well, a lot of times they have like the majority of them are on are on, are on, uh, like, uh, on like Discord and all that on the faction servers. It's like, it's not true, man. Like, be realistic. The majority of the people that fight in factions are not in comms. They're just not. And even if they are in comms, the majority don't listen to comms anyway because they want to do their own thing because they're out there just to have fun. And that's okay, right? This is why factions is good for teaching the basics, but it's not good to teach like a, a Zerg to actually fight because you're, I, I can't tell you how many times uh, people have like gotten Zergs from factions and have tried to go to the black zone and act like they can swing their dick around. And, and I promise you it doesn't, it doesn't go down really well for them. It really, really, really doesn't, right? Um, we had one like back in like season 11, there was this, this group, I think it was like a... a Thetford people and and they decided that they were going to own fucking territories in the in the outlands so they came out and they, they did have like 100 people they came out and they fought again I don't even remember who they fought against but they fought against a group of like 60 and they got steamrolled bro like absolutely dumped right and by the way this is not the only time this is literally has happened many times because factions does not teach the proper concepts so Gath, Gath is saying in the chat uh, this array and different scene as faction color. Yeah, yeah. So you're a faction color. Yeah. So that's the thing, right? Like I'm not shitting on factions. Like factions very important actually. Like I'm actually really glad that SBI implemented factions because it's a really good way to learn the basics of ZVZ. But when you're talking about training a, a, a Zerg to actually fight properly, uh, you're doing yourself a disservice by, by doing factions, right? So it's a medium cost because again, you spend a lot of time. Like, like you know, people who play factions, you, you guys know. You go and you run a bunch of zones and you go and try to chase Zergs and the, and most of the time the Zergs run away from you, right? And so you're chasing and chasing and chasing and chasing and you finally get a fight, right? And it's like, it's great once you get a fight, but it does take a long time to get that fight, right? So that's why it's a medium cost. And also the silver cost is medium because for the most part with factions, you're kind of regearing only yourself, right? Uh, there are some guilds that do regear like factions, but it's it's not a lot right and so usually people and also like yellow zone right like they don't die so it's like how much are you regreeing N nothing right so um it's medium cost but low effectiveness right um the next one is low cost right so very low amount of time or not sorry not low amount of time this actually this actually is a higher amount of time but it's very low in silver cost okay this is very 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 low in silver cost okay and it's negligible effectiveness. It's like basically like you're not learning much at all. Like honestly, you're learning almost nothing. And this is when you go out and you ZVZ only when you outnumber the enemy. So if you go in and ZVZ again, like let's say you have a 60 man group and you look at, at a group that has like 40 man and you're like, yeah, I'm going to take that fight. But you won't take a fight that's like 60 v 50. It's like you're only taking fights when you heavily outnumber the enemy. And that's going to basically be negligible effectiveness. And the reason is, is because when you overwhelm the enemy, it's very easy to make a million and one mistakes. You're not going to get punished for them because you outnumbered the enemy, right? So what I'm saying is, what are you teaching your members? What kind of habits are your members learning? If all they're doing is fighting enemies who they outnumber, you're not teaching them good habits. You're not teaching them good positioning. You're not teaching them to counter engage appropriately, right? You're not teaching them the concepts that will really make them great. And so when they go and actually fight a Zerg that's about their numbers, they're going to get wiped. 
I mean, think of Arch. Arch is exactly this, right? Arch usually fights when they outnumber the enemy. And the majority of Arch players don't progress much because of this, right? They're, they're hurting themselves, right? But it is low cost because usually the, the, these guilds, they, they outnumber the enemy. And so they'll just, they'll just take the fight and then, and then go home. And at the same time, they're not losing much because, because, well, they're not losing much because they're usually winning because they're outnumbering the enemy, right? So this is what I've learned. Okay. This is, this last one is what I've learned to be kind of like the sweet spot for being able to find a low cost, but not low effective, more like a medium effectiveness, right? A low cost and medium effectiveness tool to be able to train a Zerg. And this is 20v20 arena scrims, okay? 20v20 arena scrims allows you to fight Zergs that are 20v20 is like the bottom of ZvZ, right? Now, the arena itself is not great, I will say it's not great, but you know what it does do? It has a lot of chokes and those chokes allow you to fight and learn how to fight on chokes as well as learn how to kite. Because if they break the choke, you can learn how to kite backwards, right? The reason it's low cost is simple, right? No silver cost. I mean, uh, except for pots and, 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 and food, right? I mean, whatever, right? Beyond that, there's no real cost. The time it takes, is not a lot because if you can mass the 40 people, get them geared up and ready to go, you start instantly and then you fight. And guess what? Right after the first, uh, you know, training session, you can do a, another one right after. You can do another one right after and you can basically ZVZ over and over and over and over. Granted, it's capped at 20v20, but it's still, quote unquote, a ZVZ. It's the lowest level of ZVZ, but it is a ZVZ, right? And it is at 20v20 level that you actually learn all the extremely important concepts to ZVZ at 100 plus. Okay, the concepts themselves about how to position, about when to auto attack, about when to drop a Q, when to drop a W, when to drop your E, all those concepts are best learned at 20v20, 30v30 at the most. If you're a person that just started playing the game and, and you get thrown into a Zerg that is a hundred person Zerg, you're better off going to a smaller guild to learn ZVZ first at a smaller guild that only does 20 or 30 people. Right? Because they're going to teach you the concepts better than a Zerg with 100 people. Okay, So it's very low cost and medium effective because, again, it is a ZVZ. So here's the thing about the 20v20 arena scrims. Um, I'm going to give you guys the, the outline of how I uh, run the 20v20 arena scrims whenever I would run them. Um, but honestly, there's a million, way, a million ways to do this and you guys can choose however you want to do it right uh this is just what i did and, and and it worked for me really well but i'm sure that there's other ways of doing it right so with 20 v 20 arena scrims we set a rule right where we have 20 v 20 on each side and then if anybody dies they they respawn at the tent right but if anybody dies we tell them don't come out of the tent you stay at the tent until the zerg gets wiped basically until the zvz is over right and then you you all come out of the tent and we basically do another ZVZ, right? And so when you do that, you're actually making it where if you die out in the, in, the, in, in, in the open world, you're not coming back quickly, right? Unless you're like fighting right outside town or right outside your hideout. But in reality, you're not coming back very quickly. You're not coming back as quick as, as you respawn on a 20v20 script, right? So what I'm saying is we're making sure that it feels more like a ZVZ, where if you do lose one player, you feel it. You feel that loss of player. And now you have to adapt to fight the enemy with one less player or two less players, whatever it is, right? So that's the rule that I set for 20v20 arena scrims. And I know it's kind of hard to make sure that every player follows it. But I mean, it's your job to implement that, right? Another thing too is when I run 20v20 uh, arena scrims, there are two types of fights I, I usually take, right? And, and by the way, I, we never capture the rocks, right? So it's not about capturing the rocks. It has nothing to do with that. And also we never split, right? We never do like 10 on each side or nothing like that. We just do a 20 v 20 straight up, right? So, and the reason we don't capture rocks or anything is because we don't want the points to just end the fight, right? We want to be able to fight for the full half hour that, that the game allows you to fight, right? So what we do is there's two kinds of fights that we do in, in that arena, in that arena script. Uh, one of them is the choke fights, right? So we fight literally on the long chokes on the on the sides of the of the of, of the of the map, right? Um, I mean that's just pretty straightforward. You just fight the chokes, right? The second one 
is we fight at the center rock, right? Whatever the fucking rock is, the center center pillar, right? We fight at that center pillar. We have one group go on the northeast side, one group at the southwest side. And then we basically go and say, all right, three, two, one. All right, ZVZ started, boom. And then we just start the ZVZ, right? And that area for a 20v20, that area is actually really, really good. And it's very realistic because you have some ways to flank around your enemy on the east and west side, right? With the little bridges. So, and that's very realistic in the open world. You have ways where you can kind of wrap around the enemy, right? Um, and then on top of it, it's like, it's enough space where you can spread out properly, where you're not just going to get clumped and dumped because it's super tight, like chokes. So those two things teach the, the Zerg how to fight in, in chokes. And it teaches them how to fight in like a quote unquote open world scenario, right? So the rock also helps a lot because it's kind of acts like, like, let's say like in the open world, there's like, there's like rocks, right? Or there's trees or whatever, you know, there, there's shit like that. So that also helps. One of the other things that I do is after, after the first like set of scrims, um, and, and the scrim thing, uh, finishes, we switch sides. And so that way one side can be on the Southwest side and the other side is Northeast. And then they flip and now, now they, they basically flip the sides and now they're, they're fighting at the different angle. So all these things are very, very useful to learning the, the concepts of ZVZ and they are extremely low cost, right? So this is the best way that I know to, to ensure that you train your Zerg. Now, when I say do this, I'm not talking about just do this, right? No. I mean, if you just do this, you're going to be good. But at the same time, you also need some open world experience, right? There's, I, I remember it's medium effectiveness, not high effectiveness, right? So what I, I, I tell people, what I usually encourage people to do is like, Hey, Let's say you fight, like, let's say you mass up on two different timers every day. Okay, that's fine. One of the timers, do open world. The other timer, do arena scrims. And literally, the, remember, the, the open world masses are about an hour and a half, right? So do arena scrims for about an hour, hour and a half at most. And, and it'll feel just like a regular CTA. But the difference is that you're going to actually fight a lot more. And people are going to learn how to play a lot more, right? That's extremely, extremely important. Uh, Gas says, Arch only remind me the on the top of my robot, dude. I, I don't know who that is, man. I have no idea. All right. So the next section is uh, all systems go, right? So it's basically this section is like when you're ready. Okay. You, you, you know how you're going to train your Zerg. You know how much gear you can lose, how long it's going to take you to train the Zerg. You know what Zerg you have and what you want to train. And you also know what your collar is, right? Now it's time to start training, right? And this is very easy. I mean, you just have to start training. But I do advise it is best if you as a leader go and tell the, the guild, hey, guys, we are now training to get better. Okay, just the announcement of saying that is going to help a lot. And remember, I said one of the biggest things was people had egos and they, they weren't really with it when it came to like, you know, learning more and getting better. Right. So announcing that the guild is now training or retraining. Right. Or, or they're like, uh, you know, kind of like uh, reassembling themselves. Right. This makes it so that the entire guild kind of has a the mentality that we're learning it, it promotes an educational environment and by the way if you think oh no i don't want to tell my guild that we're learning because it'll make them feel like we're falling back or like we're, we're dropping behind or whatever listen i've been in uh some of the some of the strongest guilds in the game ever m for many years and i'll tell you every single one of them has at some point or another announced that we're training that we got to retrain the Zerg, that we got to go back to basics, right? And, and when I say they've at some point or another, I'm not talking about once. I'm talking about multiple times, like literally almost every season at the beginning of the season, right? This is extremely important. So don't feel like, oh, no, I don't want to tell my members that. No, tell them because they should know. They should know that, that the guild has a plan to get better, to progress, right? Um, another thing is you cannot be afraid to get rid of the people who will not learn just because they're your friend, just because they've been part of the guild for a while. Listen, if they're a cancer to the guild because they are telling people, don't listen to the caller. They're saying, don't wear that composition. Don't do that when, when you're trying to teach a Zerg, right? And there's this one guy who's just like going against you on every single thing. 
that person needs to go. And the reason is, is because they're poisoning every other member of the guild, right? So you, you need to be able to kind of like pull the weeds out of, you know, the yard, man, because, because they're going to kill everything in sight. Okay. Another thing is you got to build a core, right? You're going to have a, a solid group of people in your, in your guild. And everybody knows who, who that group of people is in each guild, right? Um, even if you have like a 30 man Zerg, uh, 10 of them are the core. Right. And like, that's just the way it is. And, and that, that core is like the guys that show up every day. They're the leaders, they're the officers, they're the recruiters They're or they're just people that have been there forever. Right. And these, this core, you have to make sure that they go along with everything that is happening. Right. They have to set goals. They have to set standards and, and they also have to make sure that they're helping new players. Right. And, and in order to try to keep this core going, in order to build a core, you have to set these long distance goals because otherwise a player is going to be like, oh, we're training. Oh, I don't I don't want to be part of a training guild. I'm 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 leaving. Right. So then I leave and then I go somewhere else. Right. And it's like, no, you want to retain the players that you're training. So the way you retain them is like, hey, listen, this entire season, we're going to train next season. We're going to go for gold. Right. And in the season after that, we're going to go for crystal. Now you're laying out a plan for a whole year and you're basically telling your members, hey, guys, this guild is going to continue on for one year and we have goals set for us in this year. If you want to be part of it, stay with us. And I'll tell you, when people hear those goals and stuff from a guild, they are a hundred times more likely to stay. Right. And if they stay, while you're teaching them, guess what? Now you have a growing better Zerg. But if you teach a Zerg something and then they keep quitting the guild, then suddenly you're going to have to keep teaching and teaching and teaching over and over and over. And it's never, it's going to be an unending thing, which at the same time, I do have to say that there is there, the, the training, the training ha, doesn't finish, right? You're always going to have to train new people at all times because people quit the game or people leave the guild for whatever reason. So you don't ever feel like going back to training again is a bad thing. It's a good thing. Remembering the basics is always a good thing. Um, also, another tip that I, I can I can give to people is once you're training, once you're you're actually like going and training, right? You should do assessments, right? Whether whether it's like a, a weekly status check, just kind of like you know see who is progressing or who did really well this week or who had some good highlights this week, right? Um, who, 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 who is kind of filling in roles that we need and, and who, who's coming up with ideas, what is working and what needs, needs more work, right? So discussing these things and also kind of, uh, incentivizing the members and congratulating for their progress that they're making is great, man. Because again, you want to make sure that they stay in your guild. And if they feel appreciated for the work that they're putting in, they are much more likely to get to to stay with the guild, right? Uh, Ultra violence, yo, what's up, man? He said it's a it's a machine. The Zerg needs constant maintenance at a minimum. Yeah, and that's exactly what it is, man. It's you constantly have to be reassessing your Zerg, right? Every time someone leaves the guild, someone joins the guild, you have to look at the numbers again. Look, look. Oh, if you lost the tank in the guild and then you added somebody else to the guild, but that other somebody else is a DPS they kind of just changed the entire aspect of your of your guild, right? Because now you have one less tank and one more DPS. So being able to constantly maintain your Zerg and, and see where your Zerg is, is doing well and where they need help with, extremely important, right? Another thing is, I'll tell you the truth, man. Training a Zerg for a prolonged period of time, it kind of gets mundane, right? It kind of gets boring. Right. That's the truth, man, because if you kind of just do the same fucking thing every day, day in, day out, it'll start to get a little boring. OK, so it's your job to try to keep it spicy. Right. You got to try to keep it going. You got to make it fun. Right. Whether that's just like, hey, you know what? Today we're going to practice all melee comp. Right. Great. Today we're going to practice all range comp. Today, we're going to practice, uh, you know, fighting without enigmatics. Today, we're going to practice fighting without uh fucking fallen and we're only gonna run nature healers right these things keep it spicy where people are like yo that's weird but you know what it teaches them a lot because they realize wow i have to play totally different because we don't have an enigmatic like you don't understand how different you have to play when you don't have an enigmatic and why is it important you're like well no i mean i'm never gonna take a fight if i don't have an enigmatic yes you will because you're gonna be in the middle of a fight 
and the enemy's gonna fucking flank you and kill all your enigmatics. And then suddenly you have to fight without enigmatics, don't you? So fighting, learning to fight without certain roles is actually really, really important. Because if you're ever put in that situation on the field, you have to know how to respond to it, right? And this is what keeps it spicy is that that way people know that they're not just doing the same fucking thing every day because that does get boring, right? Um, another thing is, and, and this is a caution. This is a, a like a really, really, really big and important caution, okay? You have to be mindful of your Zerg, okay? Too much training is actually bad, okay? It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You're not trying to train your Zerg in two months. And if you think you are, then, then you're already, your mindset's already wrong. Like I said from the very beginning, training a Zerg takes about a year, okay? It really does. That's just the way it is. There's not a lot you can change it. If you think you're the exception, then, you know, try to do it in nine months. But trying to be like, yeah, I'm going to take it from one year to two months, no, it's it, it's not gonna happen. And so if you try to just train and train and train and train too much, people are gonna get tired, man. They're gonna get very tired and they're gonna get burnt out. And if you burn people out while they're training, then they're most certainly gonna leave the guild. That's just, it's, it's 100% gonna happen, right? So you have to be very mindful of your Zerg and how they're tolerating. If they need a day off, give them a day off. There may be some people who are like, no, we don't need a day off. Let's keep it going. But a lot of people do. A lot of people need days off. So give them the days off. That's very important, right? And uh, last thing is that you have to encourage feedback. Feedback is so incredibly important, man. You have to be able to have debates about what CVZ gear is good, what calls are better than others, right? What individual situations and whatever it is, right? You have to be able to, to encourage the feedback of everything, right? If, if there's a guy that is playing permafrost and some other guy's playing Lombo and the Lombo guy tells the permafrost, hey man, try to hold your E a, a little bit more next time because that way I can hit my E on top of yours, right? Something like that. The other person, the permafrost guy should be like, okay, cool. And they should work together. But it shouldn't be like, yo, you're doing it too early, man. You know, like that's discouraging it, right? That discourages a lot of people. People get upset. They get heated. And the reason they get heated, you have to understand, is because they care. They really do care. That's why they're mad, right? We don't get mad about things we don't give a damn about. We get mad about things we care about. And so you got to understand that people get upset because they care. But you need to kind of guide them into positive feedback to ensure that the guild is getting better because of their energy. Channel that energy that they have to getting better, but channel it in a way in which the entire guild benefits, not where the entire guild just doesn't want to fucking train ever again, right? It's extremely important. So the last section, uh, like I told you guys, today's kind of a, a little bit of a shorter one. Uh, the last section is what I mentioned earlier. The training is never done, Right. Just because you're quote unquote done training and like your Zerg is actually like doing well does not mean you're actually done training. You're always going to have new players. You're always going to have uh, veterans who retire or just go to a different guild. You're always going to have that, right? It, it Turnover is, is, is going to happen. You're going to get recruits who are not as experienced. And even if you do get a recruit that is experienced from a different guild, they're experienced with the different guild. You got to realize, like, uh, when I joined Take Care back in, like, season 16, I think, season 15? I don't know. Se yeah, season 16. When I, jo I joined Take Care in season 16. Uh, when I joined Take Care, like, I mean, I was super experienced in the game already, right? Like, extremely experienced. But when I joined Take Care, it took me about a week, maybe two weeks, to kind of get the hang on things on how, on how they did things there, right? Because every guild does things differently, right? And some people take even longer. Some people take a month or two months to be able to kind of uh, acclimatize into the new guild, right? So you got to realize that the training is never done. You need to always train people, especially the new members in the guild. Uh, Ultraviolence says, the players lose interest and play worse if you don't evolve the play. They lose brain plasticity. Yeah, it's true. It, it's, it's really true, man. Like they, they, they just start playing worse because they get bored, to be honest. And so everybody likes to have fun by playing different things. This is why a lot of really good players tend to switch the weapon they play quite often. Right, you'll see a really good player who one day is playing Lombo, and then the next day he's playing Demon Fang, and the next day he's playing fucking 
I don't know, Blood Letter. And the next day he's playing uh, Heavy Mace, right? And it's like the motherfucker is just changing everything around. And, and the reason is, is because he's bored. And you have to, when you see that with your veteran players, you have to try to keep them involved and you have to try to get them to, to stay engaged, right? Um, so again, the at, at the point that you have where, where now it's like, okay, you've trained your Zerg for six, seven, eight, nine months, right? Great. The majority of your Zerg knows how to play and, and it plays well together. That's another really important thing, right? They need to learn how to play together, not alone, together. So once the, 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 the players know how to, how, how to play, for the most part, now you have a lot of players in your guild who are now trained ZVZers, right? So use them, put them to work and say, hey, I need you to teach People who come in to play. Let's say I, I, I recruit a, a, a new healer and I have a really good healer in my guild. I'm like, hey, man, can you go and mentor this guy? Make sure he he's like doing the right shit, right? And so then that guy goes and basically takes a one-on-one -on -one approach with that other healer that just came in and says, look, hey, man, this is how we do things here. This is what we want you to do. Why don't you record some fights and we'll watch them together? Just doing that a few times, man, I can tell you people progress very quickly. Very, very quickly, right? And this is another thing, right? ZVZ review. So when when you have like a fight, right? Any kind of fight, whether it's a you know a, a faction or an open world uh, scrims, whatever it is, we have any fights. Doing a quick review after the fight, after the CTA, is very important. And it's not just important for training, but it's also important for morale, especially when you lose. You go out there, you fight a ZVZ, and you get dunked, right? And then everybody's like, oh man, fuck, like. Oh, we're garbage. Uh, we're never going to amount to anything, right? It's like, dude, like that mentality is, is, is so bad. It, it will kill a guild so quick. So what you need to do is make sure that you go and do a, a review and be like, all right, all right, listen, guys, listen, guys. Like, yeah, we played like shit, but let's look at the fucking video and let's find out how we can do better. All right. And then when you watch the video, don't just be like, oh, dude, fucking why did you do this? You motherfucker, like, why Why did you do that? You you suck. You know, no, don't do that. Instead, be like, oh, man, see right there? Had you hit that clump, man, you would have literally on your own wiped that entire fucking clump. You would have had a highlight reel of 10 people. Had you just done this, you would have been the fucking king right now, man. Right? And you tell it to them like that, and then suddenly they start thinking, they're like, damn, I could have been the fucking it guy today, right? I could have made a fucking difference today. So what is, they go back and they after the CTA, after the review, after everything, you know what they're going to be thinking? They're going to be like, you know what? Next time I'm going to make sure I fucking do that. Right. But if you just tell them, why did you do that? And get mad at them. It's like, they're not going to, they're not, why would they, why would they get better? You're just attacking them. Right. So give them a reason. Be like, Hey, listen, had you done this, this would have been the outcome and we would have been better. Right. Because of it. And, and you would have, you would have had a really good moment there. You would have, you would have helped us out a lot. Like, it, let's say we got flanked by a, by a, by a fucking bomb squad. It's like, Hey man, listen, uh, you're a heavy mace. You could have stopped that dude, but like you were on the opposite side. Like you should have been on this side. You should have been on the West. Right. Imagine if you had been on the West, you could have stopped all of that dude. Right. An entire bomb squad on your own. You would have stopped it and we would have lived and probably win. Right. That heavy mace guy is going to be like, damn, like, I I I, I want to make that difference for my team, right? I want to I want to do that, right? Because at the end of the day, everybody wants to win, and and on top of everybody wants to win, everybody wants to know that they did well, right? Knowing that we did well is what drives us to play this game, right? So you have to be able to review DVZs after the fights, especially when you lose, especially when morale is down, and bring that morale back up right bring that morale back up and make sure you guys let them know at the end be like hey listen guys we play terrible but you know what we know what we fucked up in tomorrow we'll do better all right if anybody got any questions let me know and that's it right you leave it right there and it's like it's great man because then people are like all right hey man thanks i appreciate it you know because guess what they were down in the dumps and now you brought them back up right you gave them hope and that's important right that's very very important so the last thing is you have to have an engaged circ Right. And, and, and this is, again, it goes back to encouraging feedback. Right. Ensure the discussions related to builds, metas and feedback on the caller continues. And that's extremely important because a lot of people think, oh, no, this is the caller. I can't say anything to him. No, 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 no. That's the wrong way to think. And in fact, if your caller is, is kind of shutting people down from giving him feedback, that caller will never progress. Right. So that's that's not a good trait for a caller to have. 
So everybody should be able to tell you where you made mistakes. Just like earlier when, when uh, in the chat, just like about like half hour ago or something, uh, some of the guys here in the chat were saying like, oh, my positioning was bad and stuff like that, right? And it's like, listen, that's great feedback, man, because I'm not fucking perfect, right? I'm not perfect. I can get better too. I've played this game for five years, but I can still progress. And anybody can tell me, they can, anybody can come up to me and tell me, listen, man, you should have done this. And sometimes they may be wrong and I might be just, oh, no, 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 I did that because of this or that. And it's like, oh, okay, cool, then no problem, great. Just like it happened earlier, right? But but there are some times that I'll look at it and be like, oh, fuck, you're right, man. Like, that's true. I, I didn't think about that. I didn't see that. And you, you have only played for a month and you saw that right you can learn from everybody and that's very important having that humility to learn from everybody is extremely extremely important uh let me read what uh, ultra violence says here yeah you have to be technical with the players not emotional that's right a hundred percent maybe even a review the day after on text so everybody can read it yeah yeah i mean like an announcement type thing right like even if you don't do it like a review because you don't have time and sometimes people don't right and that's okay but just Posting kind of an announcement saying, hey, guys, we made some mistakes, but, you know, we're going to try to work it out, help each other out to try to, like, make sure we do better next time. Right. Like, that's so important. Getting everybody on the same page. If you're not going to give feedback in a digestible format that makes the player interested in playing the next day, it's better to not give it at all. Exactly. Exactly. Because then you turn people off of, of, of learning. It makes people not want to learn. And, and, and if they don't want to learn, then guess what? Your, your Zerg's not going to get better because every player in your Zerg matters. And this is what people, a lot of people don't understand is every individual player matters. Every single best skill in the game, I'm telling you 100%, this is the truth. Every single best skill in the game and every best caller in the game, when they see somebody die, when that person could have lived, they say, bro, why'd you let that guy die? And the reason is, is because everybody might be like, bro, like we have like a 150 man Zerg. Why do we care about one guy? Why? Because one guy matters. Every individual in your Zerg matters, right? And if you have a smaller Zerg, that individual matters even more, right? So if the biggest Zergs in the game and the best Zergs in the game care about every individual that dies in a fight, then that means that you should be caring about them too, because Every individual brings an extra dynamic to the fight that can help you win, right? So when one individual decides, I don't give a fuck anymore and doesn't want to learn anymore, that will handicap the, 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 your Zerg's future, right? That's, it's, it's extremely important to kind of get in touch with your Zerg, identify your Zerg, identify your, your caller, your economy, how you're going to do things and set goals, but also ensure that you... Continue to foster that educational environment for, so that people can learn together, right? And also retain members. Uh, Max says, I follow you right now for this amazing real fact. And, oh, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you. So, yeah, so that, that that's it. Um, we're done. This is the stream. I, I told you guys it was going to be a little shorter. Also, because uh, I, I know we got reset day today and stuff. So, uh, you know, I, I know some of you guys are probably like in the fucking CTA right now. And, and, and you guys are just listening to me and not listening to your caller. Go fucking listen to the caller. But uh, yeah, so uh, if anybody has any questions at all about anything right now, go ahead and drop it in the chat and, and, and I'll answer any question. Currently sat on a tower boss. Yeah, I told you. I know. I know y'all Y'all are playing. And here's the thing, right? This is what I said from the beginning. I don't know. I don't know how many of you guys actually saw the first episode um, just like a week and a half ago. The first episode, I told you guys straight off the bat, I said, I tried to make this stream as much as possible, uh, like a podcast, right? Where where I kind of talk to you guys on the chat, respond, but at the same time, make it a podcast where you guys can just listen. That way you guys don't have to watch, right? Now, when I do VOD reviews on Mondays, I you guys have to watch. Like that, that I can't <laughs> I can't VOD review uh, as a podcast, right? I have to show you guys things. But but for these, for this Friday, Saturday streams like today, uh, today, yesterday, I, I want to make it as much as possible like a like a podcast because it allows you guys to 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 do whatever you want right some people are listening you know in the car or, or doing whatever they're doing or, or you know you guys might be in a zvz massing up like i said earlier right you, a lot of you guys are massing up and you guys are listening here and stuff and so just kind of give you guys something to listen to and do all right any last questions i'm gonna give you guys a minute because i know the chat is usually like delayed a, a, a bit so i'm gonna give you guys a minute if not, we're going to shut it down. All 
All right, so uh, let me see. The next stream is going to be on Monday, 00, 00 UTC as always. All right, um, that's going to be a VOD review. Now, that VOD review is actually going to be really fun uh, because we're going to be talking about Escalation uh, on Monday. And we're going to talk about Escalation when last uh, this, this last Monday, Escalation decided to run a, a ranged DPS Zerg against Prologue. And it did not go well at all. It, it 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 went terribly, right? So we're gonna basically analyze that video because um, we want to answer the question of how can a Zerg who is really good because Escalation Zerg is really good, right? How can a Zerg that is really good perform so poorly when they just change their composition, right? And and so we're gonna go over that on Monday. Uh, the next. The next like a uh, uh, teaching episode is gonna be on next Friday, and that's gonna be episode five, gearing up. So gearing up episode is basically gonna teach you guys how to how to kind of uh, make your own um, your own builds, how to make your own builds, right? You're gonna you're gonna learn how to make your own builds and and what kind of things go into making your own build. Like it's very easy to just be like, oh well this weapon is good and this armor is good and these boots are good yeah yeah but you gotta have synergy with them right they, they gotta be able to click and work together very well that's extremely important and a lot of people don't think about that stuff they don't think about how it works together not just with each other the gear like the boots and the helmet but how also it works with the zerg as a whole right because if you're playing something that seems great on paper but your zerg doesn't have a spot for that then there's no reason to play it, right? So we're gonna look in, in depth and into how to make your own build. And essentially I'm gonna explain to you guys how it is that I go about predicting different weapons, predicting different uh, gear that is being used and, and has been used a lot, right? Like like when I predicted the Enigmatic and how, how the Enigmatic was gonna basically take over the game, right? And then it did, right? It's like, how did I predict that? And, and, and that's basically what I'm gonna go and talk to you guys about. So uh, Ultraviolet says, Lots of tricks with people builds people's with builds people don't realize. Yeah, it's a lot, man. It's 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 so much, and people think it's easy, but it's not. What pieces are important on which roles? Yeah, because a lot of times it's very easy to cut, like say night helmet, right? It's very easy to cut it, but then it's like you don't understand why it's important. So it's like if you don't understand why it's important, then you're definitely not understanding whether you can cut it or not. In some roles, sure you can cut it. In others, you can't, and it, it's really important. All right. Without that, all right, yeah, so the next the next stream is going to be Monday again, 00, 00 UTC. That's going to be the VOD review. Make sure you guys are here for it. Uh, if you haven't followed, make sure you guys hit the follow. Uh, I finally got the uh, the affiliate on uh, on uh, on Twitch, so I'm glad about that. We actually got it. We got affiliate within a week. Uh, well, like, like nine days, I think. It was like nine days. We got affiliate for the stream, so it's awesome. It's awesome. I, I'm... I'm I'm, I'm, I'm happy about it and I thank you guys because I, I could not have done it, you know, getting to affiliate without you guys, you know, following and watching and all that. So uh, the, the next road is going to be partner, but uh, partner is going to be a while. That, that, that one that one definitely is going to take a quite a bit of while. But anyway, thank you guys for coming. I'll see you guys on Monday.